Good morning, brothers and sisters in Christ. It's a beautiful morning out, isn't it? Today's reading will be from the book of Hebrews, chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. I'll be reading out of the English Standard Version. Again, this is Hebrews, chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. The heading is, The Supremacy of God's Son. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom he also created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. Good morning. It's good to see each and every one of you here this morning. As has been mentioned, if you are visiting with us, we are delighted to have you here. Invite you to be back with us at each and every opportunity that that you can. I apologize for the PowerPoint this morning, missing the first three verses of that. But hopefully you were turned there and were able to follow along with that as well. I hope that you have had a good week. I look out at the audience and another group of snowbirders has returned. Uh, and we're glad for that. And when Jim and Nancy get here, I believe that will be all of our snowbirders if i recollect that correctly and glad to have them home and uh jealous that you get to spend the winter where it's nice and warm and comfortable and uh but we're glad that you're here where you belong uh and it's my understanding that uh next november you have to have a passport uh to get in the state of florida anyway so just stay here with us uh, Kevin read for us in Hebrews chapter 1, the first four verses. Uh, it's a very familiar, it's a very popular verse because it talks about, uh, in the very first verse, about the idea of how God communicates with us today. Uh, and a lot of people will take these first four verses and they'll spend a lot of time emphasizing for us the idea that God communicates to us through His Word. There are a lot of people in the world today who believe that they, through some kind of supernatural connection with God, believe that God speaks to them directly, uh, that they somehow hear the voice of God, that they have somehow become a messenger of God for the world today. Uh, that's a very serious claim. It's a very dangerous claim as well, because if that is true then what we have as the Bible is not the complete authority of the Word of God. It leaves open the idea that there is more to be said. That if God is communicating directly with certain individuals uh, about Scripture or about divine revelation, uh, then there is a problem with trusting the authority uh, of the Word of God. And we realize that as it says here, that God speaks to us through His Word. But the writer of Hebrews goes on in these first four verses to communicate with us the idea of Christ being better. We all like better, don't we? We live in a world today where we want things better. Every so many months, you can update your phone so that it can be better. You're not satisfied with the iPhone 5? Now you can go to the iPhone 6. Is there a 7? Not yet, but it's coming, right? We want things better. In automobiles, we want things better. We like the newer technology. We want to compare ourselves in a lot of ways uh, to a lot of different things. That in our lives, many of us have spent some time comparing ourselves to someone else, whether it's in a positive way or whether it's in a negative way. You know, folks, comparing yourself to somebody else can be a very dangerous thing. It can affect you in a negative way and it can affect you in a positive way that's negative. 
Now let me say this, let me put it this way. We can make ourselves look good compared to certain people of the world, can we not? Every one of us can pick somebody in the world that we can compare our life to to make ourselves look good. Example, a Christian, a person who is trying to live a faithful life that uh, struggles along the way. You know, we can find somebody in the world who is a non-Christian, who is a non-believer, who lives and does things that are detrimental to their physical health and to their spiritual well-being. And we can say, now, compared to them, I, I'm doing just fine. And we strive for that which makes us better. We compare homes, we compare cars, accomplishments, sports teams, and the list could go on and on. Only because we're striving for that which is better. Is there really anything better? We want to be around better people. We want a better product. And if you're sports minded, we always seem to jump on the bandwagon uh, and we want the better team. Right? I mean, nobody's been a Cubs fan for 150 years. (laughs) And now all of a sudden there are Cubs fans coming out of the woodwork. There's one sitting on the front row this morning. Uh, And we're going to take his confession in a moment and... uh, He can repent of that sin in his life. But certainly, as we look at this passage of Scripture, here the writer of Hebrews is using the same kind of comparison and the same kind of approach when it comes to Jesus Christ. The title of the lesson, as you've already seen, is Christ is Better. I don't care what you've chosen in this life. I don't care what you uh, do in this life or decisions you have made in this life. The one thing you need to understand is from the Bible, not only here in Hebrews, but in other places that we're going to look at, Christ is better. Of all the decisions you're going to make, that you need to understand that here in this chapter, we're being told that Christ is better. Now it goes on specifically to say that Jesus here is better than the angels. You know, a lot of people have the misunderstanding that, you know, Christ is just like an angel. Christ is not an angel. That when you're talking about authority and you're talking about beings, there is God the Father, there is God the Son, there is God the Holy Spirit, and then there are angels, and then there's us. So many times you hear when someone leaves this earth that someone will say, well, they've, they've gone to be an angel. No, you haven't. Okay? It sounds great, it sounds comforting, but we will never be like those angels. Because that's just the way God created things. Jesus Christ is not an angel. Do the angels have the same power that Jesus Christ would have? Absolutely not. Angels were created for a purpose. And the purpose was to be a messenger or a ministering spirit that only comes from the presence of God. Many in the world today believe in guardian angels. That everybody, they will teach the idea that every one of us, in some capacity, has a guardian angel that is watching over us. Well, the problem that I have with that is, that's not what God in the Bible describes those angels as doing. And number two, you will never find the phrase guardian angel mentioned anywhere in Scripture. We like to think we have our own special angel, but as Christians, we all have all the angels ministering to our every need and I think that's a beautiful idea but here the writer is specifically focusing on the idea that in in our lives Christ needs to be the better choice in our life I want to give you six or seven things here this morning of what makes Christ better for us in our lives number one a more excellent name You know, a name uh, is an important thing. A lot of your children are given family names, are they not? Uh, Most all of, well, none of our kids, except for one, uh, we gave sort of a family name. 
But the name of Jesus was given by inheritance of God. We go on to find and understand through the Bible, names are important. Names will either define your reputation, but names identify. I know who Claire is. Okay. Now, if someone says, uh, who are you talking about? I'm talking about Claire. Well, what does she look like? We, we can identify her by her looks, but it's easier just to call her by her name, isn't it? In the world of religion today, does a name mean something? If you read in Scripture, whose church is it? Is it ours? No. So it shouldn't wear the name Christian. Does it belong to some man? No. So it shouldn't bear that individual's name. If the church belongs to Christ and a name defines identity, thus the church is of Christ. So a name is important. The name is important in a lot of different ways. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean because a church will bear the name Church of Christ that it's right. Because you can have the name right and still be wrong in a lot of other things. And many of you who travel enough notice that you can go from one place to another and find many, many different things. But a name is important because it's important of identity. Even people who know nothing about the Bible would never name their children Judas or Jezebel. Can you imagine having a twin boy and a twin girl and going in and saying, well, what's their name? Well, we'd like you to meet Judas and we'd like you to meet Jezebel. What would your reaction be? You know, I think I'd take a step back. But we understand that a name carries with it a reputation. My dad used to always tell me, son, all you've got is your reputation. All you're going to be known for in life is your reputation of the kind of individual that you are and how you live your life. And my dad grew up in a time that when you shook somebody's hand, that was your word. And that word was golden. And you didn't want to do anything to tarnish the reputation of your name. Well, somewhere along the line, somebody tarnished that idea. Bought a car lately? Bought a house lately? There are so many documents that you have to sign because they don't trust our handshake anymore that says, I will pay you what I owe you for whatever I'm buying from you. Because we've moved from the idea that my word is sacred. And the Bible says your name is your reputation. We realize nobody would use those two names. Or at least I've never met anybody with the name Judas or Jezebel. Maybe they're out there. I don't know. Number one, number one, a more excellent name that we have. Proverbs 22, a good name is to be chosen rather than great riches. In Ecclesiastes chapter 7 and verse 1, a good name is better than precious ointment. And in verse 5 here it says, he is God's son. And the angels were never called son. You can go on in the reading past verse 4 and read verse 5 and it specifically quotes from scripture there. To where it says no angel was ever called son. They fall in a different category. Number two, he is worshipped. Christ is better because that's we worship him. He is worshipped by the angels, as the Bible would say, that they worship what he does. In Matthew chapter 4 and verse 10, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Why are you here today? Who did you come here today to, to, to please? Who did you come here today to worship? And if your mind should be focused on nothing more and nothing less right now than what we're here to do, and that's worship the Almighty God. I know life's hectic. I know some of you are going through tribulations and trials within yourself, within your families, within all aspects of your personal life. But this moment in time, on this first day of the week, is special. 
Because it is a time to where we direct our very thoughts and our very actions to the simple goal of worshiping our God and nothing else. We partake of the emblems of the Lord's Supper and many will say, well, you know, examine yourself you know, why we do this, I believe that examination goes a lot farther than just on Sunday morning. But especially in this time of our worship, so let a man look deeply with inside himself to make sure that he is in the right frame of mind to do this that God has commanded us to do. Because it's that important. Because he is worshipped. In the book of Revelation chapter 19 and chapter 22, John was told not to worship the angel, but rather to worship God. You know, I believe God had it all figured out. Don't you? There are things in this life, there are things in the Bible that I read, and I want to know more. You know, I've talked and talked about the Ark of the Covenant. You know, and and the greatness that that represented to the children of Israel as they're wandering through the wilderness and as they're ready to, as Joshua is ready to take them into the promised land, that the ark went first. And it's that important of the power that was there, the power of God. Folks, there's a reason that we do not have the ark of the covenant today, and that reason is this. If we had it, we would be no different than the people that when Moses came down out of the mountain, he found them worshiping a golden calf. Because we want to see the object of our worship in this life. Most people do. And if we had the Ark of the Covenant, it would be set up as some kind of shrine somewhere, and people will go by in the thousands just to worship that box. Doesn't make sense to you? Let me tell you a little story. I may have told you this when I first got here. There was a lady who cooked tortillas on the sidewalk in Mexico. Kind of a familiar practice. One day she lays those tortillas out on the sidewalk. And as she goes back to get one, she picks it up. And there in the middle is an image of a man. She thinks that's God telling her and giving her that picture of Jesus Christ. She goes into her house. She erects a shrine to it. She puts it in in some kind of airtight container to where it will not decay. And she builds this shrine, this altar, to this tortilla. And there she worships it every day. Word got out about that in the local town. And people thought that she was being blessed. So now, on a daily basis, this is a true story. You can look it up on the internet. People file by by the thousands. To pray in front of a tortilla shell that has the image of what she says is Jesus Christ. You see, God knew what he was doing when he didn't leave for us any other image other than his word telling us what is acceptable worship in the eyes of God. God is a spirit. And those who worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. He is better because He is worshipped. Number three, He is God. He's God. And I know the understanding of the Godhead is confusing to some. There is one God, but in that relationship of one God, there are three personalities. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. doesn't change the fact that He is part of the Godhead. No angel can claim to be God. No human can claim to be God. And the verse clearly declares for us the deity of Jesus Christ. John chapter 1 Verse 1 and verse 14 talks about how the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Who is that? It's Jesus Christ. Because He is God. Number four. He is a kingdom. And clearly that would by nature make Him a king. And His kingdom is greater than any other kingdoms, making Him the greatest king. 
There are those who believe that the kingdom is waiting to come. That Jesus is going to return to the earth and He's going to establish again a physical kingdom here on this earth. Brethren, don't misunderstand Scripture. Don't get caught in the symbolism of the book of Revelation. Understand what he says in the book of Matthew when he says, "Some There are some standing here today who shall not see death until they see the kingdom come with power. And he describes that for Peter as Peter upon this rock. I will build my church. Upon what? Upon Peter? Or upon the confession that Peter made that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. He has a kingdom. And he is the King of kings as he is declared in Revelation. Number five, he is anointed by God. Anointed with the oil of gladness, as Scripture would say, because He is God, because He is anointed, we can all rejoice because of who we are in our life as followers of Jesus Christ. Number six, He was involved in creation. The Bible clearly says in verse 10 and in Genesis chapter 1, John chapter 1, verse 1 through 3, that all things were created through Him, for Him, and by Him. And that's important in understanding why Jesus Christ is better. Number seven, he is seated at the right hand of God. That might not be important to many of us. But the right hand is considered the seat of honor. And there we see Jesus as he is described for us in Scripture, that even the apostles understood the special place of being at the right hand, and they wanted to be at His right hand, according to Matthew chapter 20. Where do you want to be seated? What's important to you? And understanding the idea of what we ought to think about, and what we ought to choose, and what we ought to want in our life, to understand that Christ is better. And I can't offer you anything this morning that's any greater than that. Where are you today? Where are you in your relationship with this world? Where are you with your relationship with Jesus Christ? Where are you in your relationship with your family? Folks, everything about our life should be dictated by our relationship with our Savior, Jesus Christ. To say and to choose because Christ is better is going to say something about our reputation and about our character. What's your reputation in the community? When someone says, do they know so and so, what's the first thing they're going to think of? When they think of Dave Onspaugh, what are they going to think? What's he going to be known as? 25 years from now, some of you won't be here. A year from now, some of us won't be here. But many who follow will be like I am, and I like to walk through cemeteries. Not necessarily to dwell on things of the past, but to see if there are people that I know. See if there's a family tree or a connection that I can make. And I just simply like to read interesting things that people put on their headstones. But when I go back to Kentucky... And I walk through family cemeteries and I come across people that I knew. And those are getting more and more every year, by the way. We'll be like some will do us in years to come and they'll walk through and they'll see your name. What will they think of you? What will they remember of you? They're going to remember Dave was a good song leader? No. Might come up. We remember the characteristics that define Dave as as a man. As a husband, as a father, and as a Christian. What will people remember about you? And about your relationship with Jesus Christ? This morning as we sing this invitation song, we're asking you to make the choice. Because Christ is better. It says, come unto me all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I 
will give you rest. Folks, there's one way to heaven and one way only. It's not through the church, though you'll be added to the church. But it's through accepting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. That is the only way to get from this place to that place. It's to put him on in baptism to have your sins washed by the blood of Jesus Christ. We give you that opportunity this morning as we stand and sing. Dave.